So hello everyone and welcome to the second webinar in our demystifying IRT's admissions process series. <clears throat> Today uh, we will be discussing specifically the essays that are required as part of the IRT application. And so by way of introduction, my name is Brittany Zorn and I am the Arts and Sciences Programs Specialist here with the IRT. I'm also an IRT alumna uh, from the class of 2013, and I'm going on my sixth year with the office, which is wild. <clears throat> <laughs> I'm Leslie Godo Solo, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome. Um, I'm IRT class of 91. This I'm the education program specialist, and I'm going into my 20th year in the IRT office. Um, so again, welcome to you all. I see some Ohio's in the place and New Orleans and um, you all from other places as well. <laughs> We're excited by everyone who's here. Fantastic. Um, so <clears throat> here is our overview for today's uh, conversation. Very similar to the um, Tuesday, the first webinar in this series. It's not a particularly long set of slides that we have, so there should be plenty of time in this hour and a half or so for you all to ask whatever questions you have and for us to take a, a little more informal and conversational tone to the overall presentation today. So feel free to put questions in the chat as they come up to you know, offer insights, to raise your hand at any point, and we're happy to engage and deviate from the slides. <clears throat> um, so to start, uh, we want to differentiate that our application has two sets of essay questions and you are not required to respond to both. You only have to require to one set of essay questions to complete the application. And so the two sets are broken up by arts and sciences applicants and education applicants. So generally speaking, if you see your discipline listed in the arts and sciences column, then you would only need to respond your intended graduate school discipline, I should say. Um, listed here in the arts and sciences column, you would only need to respond to the arts and sciences questions and vice versa for if you see your intended graduate school field listed in education, you would only need to respond to the education questions. Okay. Um, sometimes <laughs> um, there is an instance where you would want to apply to both sets of questions. And that is if you're considering applying to fields in both ANS and in education. Um, so it's a very good example. Um, if you're looking to apply to an MAT in English because you think you wanna teach middle school and or high school and or you're interested in the MA, PhD in English because you also think you want to teach at the collegiate level. Um, if your field falls in either ARS or education, depending on the program, um, then you want to choose the set of essays where you can best articulate your goals for graduate study and the career that you want to pursue after that. Um, so if you are, you know, if, if, if as you do the research, you seeing that you fit in one or the other better because of, of the folks that you can work with and because of the opportunities that are available and the coursework that you're gonna get, then situate your essay in that one field or the other. If you have any doubts, do reach out to us, okay? We can, we can talk it through. I was going to say that if Leslie didn't say that. So <laughs> yeah. Listen, we don't want you to do more work than you have to, yeah. you know, but if you are torn between the two, then we need to be able to judge your candidacy to be part of IRT based on both humanity, social sciences and education. Exactly. Okay, so now we're gonna um, take a, a deeper dive into you know, the components of a strong set of essays. You know, so what are the evaluation criteria <clears throat> that we use and what um, 
you know, how, what is it going to look like in the application for you? So if you have not already opened up the application and, and started to see the different components, <clears throat> this is what we're getting at with this slide. So, you know, each essay does have a word limit and we, up, you know, strongly look at word limit adherence um, for strong, you know, the strongest essays are the ones that stick to the word limits. Um, we also are always looking for all components of the prompt being addressed in your response. So usually these are compound questions that have you know multiple different questions embedded in them or different aspects to the question that we're looking for an answer to. And so making sure that you answer everything that is being asked of you is important. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, within the application, you're actually typing into a text box. You're so you're not like uh, uploading a Word document or like typing into a Word, making it a PDF and uploading that. We're asking you to just copy and paste text directly into a, a text box. And I'm pretty sure that the text box boxes have word limits to them. So that uh, you want to be aware of that. You can certainly draft your essay responses in a Word document or like keep a separate document somewhere where you type out your initial versions. Maybe you even have someone review them or revise them. And then you're just copy and pasting from that other document into the text box itself. And that would be totally appropriate, but you're not gonna be uploading anything for your essays in particular to the IRT application. And for the um, set of essay questions that you would not be responding to, so if you know you're applying to PhDs in sociology, you don't need to respond to the education essay questions. You can just type in an NA or not, you know, not applicable, responded to arts and sciences questions, something to indicate <clears throat> uh, that allows you to move through the application. Because I think every um, question is required, so you may not be able to like move forward until you type something into those education essay boxes that just says you know, not applicable here. <clears throat> that, that's me? Yes, okay. ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of how we evaluate each of your essays, um, we're gonna be looking at the things listed here and note that this is, this evaluation criteria is if you receive the highest score you could receive for the essays, which is five times four individuals who will be reading. So for a total of 20 points, your, your entire score is out of 100. But remember that each section, uh, the recs, the essays, um, recommenders, those are your other sections. So dealing with the essay, and if you were looking to earn a five, uh, the highest score there that the evaluator could give you, you want an essay that's well thought out, that's relevant, that's exceptionally written. They should support the IRT's mission and demonstrate your, your competitiveness for graduate study and make it clear that you can write a strong statement of purpose. Um, as I say that, I'm also thinking that some may feel like, well, I may not have, you know, the best writing um, and that's okay. We, we can account for that and we can help you get to the level that the graduate schools are going to be anticipating. Um, so I don't want you to think that you have to be the exceptional, exceptional writer. Um, we have some exceptional, exceptional writers but we have, you know, the range of writers as well. Um, we want you to respond thoughtfully and critically and thoroughly to the question. So definitely you wanna answer all of the various prompts. Um, one of the things that I would say is, you know, try to avoid being repetitive and kind of repeating the same thing over and over again. Be more concise in your train of thought and in your word choice. Um, your essay should demonstrate, okay, just read that. Nope, critical thinking, analytical skills and ability to make connections. Um, so can you think about your research and how theorists or books may apply to it? Academic and career goals, we wanna know what your plans are beyond 
IRT, so if that's teaching in a K through 12 setting, if that's administrating at a you know, small liberal arts college, um, give us the details of that. And then finally, your essays should be cohesive, grammatically sound, and use transitions as well. And I would encourage you, I think a lot of times people use the um, spell check, but it's not that the word that they actually want. So I would encourage you to do a last minute read over your essays or have someone else proof them for that kind of error. <clears throat> the only thing I want to add uh, here is if you were on Tuesday's webinar, you heard us say that um, the highest that a, an applicant, an IRT applicant can earn in any one admissions category is a five, right? Leslie was describing that. But a five is like exceptional, excellent, top notch, you know, ha, no, you know, no areas for improvement or like very few areas for improvement. The average IRT applicant is not a five, right? Like the average applicant is not fives. And we don't necessarily look to a, a five ranking as like the golden standard of, you know, um, <clears throat> like who we're hoping to admit or who who we, you know, uh, who we aspire to work with. I think the average IRT applicant is in a three to four range, which is like average to above average and has a blend of scores across the evaluation categories for the application. So it's, it's essays, it's interview, it's academic background, it's, um, why can't I remember the other category? Recommendations, letters of recommendation <laughs> and fit with the IRT mission, right? So yeah. across all five of those categories, maybe you have one five or two fives or a four or four and then a three and a three, right? So uh, to, to contribute to what Leslie was saying about you don't need to be the strongest writer uh, to, to grace our application. <laughs> um, just wanted to put that out there. Folks were not in the live uh, session on, on Tuesday. And so now we're going to look at the actual essay questions. We're just giving them to you. These are the questions. So if you haven't already opened up the application and like actually seen what the essay questions are, they're here. And um, again, just to reiterate, this presentation will be made available on our website. So you could refer back to this recording and look at these slides again if you wanted to prepare or uh, draft something before you actually open the app and get into it. Um, <clears throat> I don't, I'm wondering, should we read um, <clears throat> the questions out loud? I suppose maybe for the sake of the recording, we can read them just to have it. Um, I also want to enable our closed captioning. So forgive me for not having the closed captioning on sooner all. So the essay question, arts and sciences essay question one, please submit a brief essay describing three texts within your intended graduate school discipline that are impactful to your understanding of social justice and diversity advocacy. One text must be canonical, uh, two should be based in critical theory within your field. You would need to provide proper citations uh, for these sources as well, and each um, description or citation has 150 word limit. <laughs> so really what we're looking for here is a demonstration of your engagement within your discipline. Do you have a, a sense of, you know, scholars, frameworks, theories, ideologies, principles, topics, areas of focus that are prominent within your discipline? And what are the existing theorists, frameworks, theories, that have influenced your particular positionality and perspective. This is what we're assessing here. <clears throat> okay, for essay two, we would like you to explain how and why the study of your intended discipline has been personally meaningful to you in regards to your academic experience. So what about this field sets you on fire? What topics um, are you able to study that have a social justice lens or a diversity lens? You know, how do you see yourself um, if you're a person of color um, contributing to academia? If you're not a person of color, do you have interests that deal with issues related to folks of color? 
um, and those dynamics between white populations and BIPOC individuals. Um, this is what we're looking for here in this question. And again, that's 150 words. I say question three. So this is where we're asking you to describe your research interests now. Um, please describe your current research and the specific schools of critical thought within your discipline that inform your approach and research methodology. So the first question is like a little bit of a literature review. The second question is more about what this work means to you, why you're invested in this work, maybe how you came to this particular field. And now this question <clears throat> is asking you to actually lay out your research interests. Um, typically, if you're pursuing an arts and sciences, an arts, humanities, or social science graduate degree, you're pursuing a PhD or you're pursuing a research focused track in to, to your graduate studies. That's typically, there's always exceptions. And I'm sure someone on the call is like, well, not me, right? So that is totally fine. But um, that is why we ask this question of arts and social sciences applicants is that typically you're there's going to be an expectation of your contribution to scholarship within the field. <clears throat> so we ask uh, social science applicants in particular to discuss the scope of a current project. So in this essay question or in this part of this question, we're trying to get a sense of the work you've done previously. Have you conducted independent or formal research or worked on a, a massive project? You know, okay, massive may be an overstatement. Worked on a significant project <clears throat> within your discipline and describe the skills you honed, you know, the, the knowledge you gained. And then for MFA applicants in particular, um, we are asking you to talk about your craft. Like, what is the art <laughs> that you are? Um, focused on is it writing you know is it painting is it dance and what elements of that art form do you want to build upon through your graduate studies <clears throat> and each of these is 150 word limit so you get 150 for the base question and then if you are in social science or mfa applicant you get an additional 150 words <clears throat> okay. so then with essay four this is the looking forward. Um, so as you think about entering a master's or PhD graduate school program, what research are you interested in doing? It could be that what you are interested in doing is based upon some problem that you've seen in a research project that you've had now, and you now want to extend that project further. Um, it's an issue or a problem that you want to investigate, that you want to interrogate and or mitigate and solve in, in the best situation, right? You want to get rid of that program. I'm seeing this in my teaching or I'm seeing this in research and this is something that I want to address as a future MA PhD candidate. Um, so that's this question. Um, and we're also asking that you incorporate um, theoretical frameworks that you might utilize in that work. Um, and they should be primary and secondary texts. Um, and you know, what's the scholarly argument? Why, why is the research that you wanna do situated in sociology? Why is it situated in psychology? What methodologies are you going to utilize or methodologies and pedagogies do you want to develop that place you in that particular field? Okay. And again, we want you to succinctly put that together in 150 words. <laughs> I'm laughing because I, you know, as I'm looking at this, I, I yeah, I know some of us you know, love to write and go on and on and on. Um, but one of the things that you'll wanna get better at is being succinct in these conversations. Um, because think of this also as a process into the interview, for example. Let's say when you're accepted to IRT and you're interviewing to get into a master's or PhD program, they're gonna give you a half an hour interviewing space and they're gonna to wanna to know this very question succinctly, right? So that's 
the reason why we've tailored it in this way. I think uh, to piggyback off that, Leslie, an important um, caveat is that these essay questions are intentionally designed to mimic the questions that will be asked of you in your graduate school applications, right? So we're, we're very intentional yes. with what we're asking you to reflect on here and, and articulate because to Leslie's point, you will have to articulate these things succinctly and, and in a focused, you know, comprehensive way just a few months from now, right, for your, your PhD or your master's applications. Um, so it's all with purpose. <laughs> so uh, that concludes the arts and sciences questions for arts and sciences essays and for education essays. So essay one for education, <clears throat> please describe the graduate degree you are seeking, your chief motivations for graduate study in your discipline, and your short and long-term goals. So this is basically, you know, like, what do you, what do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? Tell us why you're seeking this degree, what you hope to achieve after, <clears throat> and um, what your, your professional and graduate school goals are. Yes, I just opened up the chat to, to confirm that uh, these essays, or that last essay in particular, is exactly like your elevator pitch for your aspirations. And then this essay, I think, is the equivalent for education, right? So the essay four for arts and sciences is like, give us your 30 second pitch. And then essay one for education is like, okay, give us your 30 second pitch. So then essay two, we ask you to explain how and why graduate study in your area of specialization will be personally meaningful to you and additive to your previous work experience. So what are you gonna gain from this program um, that will complement what you've already done and prepare you for the work that you wanna do um, in the next two years if you're in the master's program or in the next say four to five years if you're in the PhD program. Um, Yes, and, and why this work brings you joy, you know, what problem you wanna affect in the community, um, what issues have come up that you wanna address that you've seen as an educator. Um, if you're talking about K through 12, uh, if you're talking about psychology, and I think somebody mentioned counseling, for example, you know, we know in this pandemic that more and more people are in need of counseling that is relevant um, to who they are, to their person, and you want to help provide that, you know, why is this your passion, basically? And so our third essay question for education is um, a discussion of a previous experience that was significant to your pursuit of graduate study. So, you know, reflect on one uh, volunteer experience, professional experience, a role that you've ha occupied or held, um, a project that you've executed, an initiative that you started, something that contributed to your decision to continue your education with graduate school. <clears throat> and then in particular, if you are pursuing a PhD in education, we, this is the research question. Articulate your future research. You know, what is it that you're hoping to study? You know, what, what is the research agenda that you have for your dissertation, your eventual dissertation or doctoral work? <clears throat> so you can see there's a lot of parity between the arts and sciences essay questions and the education essay questions. And then essay four, again, we're asking you to talk about three texts within your discipline that have been impactful to your understanding of social justice and diversity at, at advocacy as it relates to education. Um, and in fact, we just had uh, a student tell us last evening on the call that they were asked about the books that they're reading. Uh, this was for a PhD program. And one of the questions was, what books are you engaging in now that are related to your, uh, to the research that you wanna do. Um, so if you're in a situation where you haven't had to think about this, this is the place where we want you to begin to do that. Um, 
And so at least one of those should be canonical, which means that it should be um, a work that is generally accepted as representing the field. Mm -hmm. um, and then two should be based in critical theory within your field as well. Um, so sometimes, you know, in education, uh, we have, you know, depending on the education courses you've taken and who you've taken them with, you may or may not have been steeped in, you know, d definitely they give you books to read, but you may or may not be talking about them in terms of the critical theory. Um, and so this is a way for our students to begin to do that if they haven't had these skills yet. Um, and they're definitely going to be skills that they're going to be looking for in the graduate school programs. And then you'll have a space where you can cite all of these within the text, and that text will be 150 words again. All right. So those are your questions and the arts and sciences and essay questions. <clears throat> so how do you start preparing for these now, right? What can you be doing right now to be, you know, reflecting on working towards writing really strong essays for your IRT application? <clears throat> well, if you're a PhD uh, candidate, if you're pursuing a doc uh, doctorate degree, you really want to begin to hone, identify, and articulate what your research question or agenda is. What are the areas that you want to focus on uh, within your discipline? You know, so if it's history, what's the region in the world? What's the time period in uh, in terms of you know years? Or <clears throat> um, is there a particular sort of you know event that you want to focus on, like rebellions and revolutions, or labor's unions, or um you know in far like indigeneity and farming right like just be this is where you want to be specific about whatever it is that you are hoping to address through your graduate research <clears throat> and you know you can begin to to seek more research experience for this year um as you would be like working on your graduate school applications potentially working with irt that's something you can be doing and then um uh, for master's level candidates, you want to reflect on your most significant or meaningful previous experiences. And I think uh, we could also include here, seek out more professional experience, right? Um, you want to begin to think about what has influenced your decision to pursue this field or this functional sphere of education. <clears throat> and you want to consider, are there gaps in your professional repertoire that you could fill? Uh, through volunteering or other experience over the next year. And all candidates, whether you're pursuing a doctorate degree or a master's degree, should take advantage of resources available to you for improving your writing, whether that's peers who will review your essay drafts or writing centers on campus or supervisors who are willing to <clears throat> look over materials or have conversations with you about your goals. Um, in any case, everyone would benefit from that. See some questions popping into the chat. Okay, nope, it's just Mama providing some context. <laughs> yes, so I'll I'll go through this briefly. Um, in terms of submitting an application, there are a number of components we're looking for. We uh, want students who have attended the informational session. Um, you'll su submit a completed online application by March first. And the components that we're looking for are your resume and or CV, or I should say resume or CV. You don't need to upload two, just load, upload one or the other. Um, unofficial transcripts from all credited, accredited, uh, yes, accredited um, universities. Um, yes including undergraduate and graduate institutions, uh, community colleges and any study abroad programs. Um, even if you just taken one course at one of these places, the graduate schools will want to see them. And it also informs our understanding of your academic background and record in terms of the courses that you've taken. And we use all of that to determine, can we get this student into the graduate program that they are wanting to apply to based on the coursework. Um, 
you answer a series of short essay questions, and now you know exactly what those questions are, and you're gonna submit three academic recommendations. Two of those should be um, from, uh, two should be from, oops, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time this afternoon. Two should be from, <laughs> uh, be academic, uh, meaning professors that have actually taught you, and the other can be from a professional uh, reference person um, who might be your supervisor. Um, if you're, you know, if you're working at a campus uh, in multicultural office, for example, the person who is your supervisor could recommend you there. And then we'll mm -hmm. also require you to participate in the 30 minute virtual interview. Um, and that interview invitation only comes if you have a completed application. Excellent. And that's all she wrote. So this is our general contact information. <clears throat> uh, we are largely working from home right now because of the state of uh, coronavirus <clears throat> infections in the country right now. So best way to get in touch with someone generally in the office is email also a ton of information on our website and you can find us on all the social media platforms. <clears throat> so now we open it up to you all. Questions, reactions, reflections, thoughts, ruminations, qualms, queries, inquiries, <clears throat> something else that will jive with my alliteration. We've got a question about graduate students as recommenders and Ooh. yes, that can happen, um, but you want to, at least two of your recs, you wanna be from professors who are, I would say, um, uh, you have the associate or full professor. Um, associate professor could work as well. Often, I'm sorry. Help me out, Brittany, with the rankings you have. Yeah, well, I think assistant, I, assistant is what I'm trying to say. Assistant, associate, full professor. Ideal situation, you want someone who's associate, full professor. Um, at least two of those recs to come from that individual. And then the third could be from the assistant or the PhD candidate. Um, particularly if you've worked closely with that PhD candidate, perhaps in, in the research that you've been doing, or if they have, you know, a lot of times those individuals will also run sessions outside of the classroom, like tutoring sessions or testing sessions. Um, so yes, it, it could be. I would just add to this that for your IRT application, we are pretty agreeable to, you know, receiving letters of recommendation that come from any individual who can speak to your strengths and skills, right? Like if this is someone you've, as Leslie was saying, you've worked closely with, they have context over your areas of interest, your goals, they can speak to your writing and engagement in your field, then like IRT will happily accept those letters and consider them, you know, for your application. But what Leslie's getting at is that for graduate school, there is a hierarchy of what is considered a strong or who is considered a strong letter of recommendation writer. And that hierarchy starts with full tenured professor, you know, associate, assistant, lecturer, graduate TA, you know, <clears throat> um, uh, visiting professor, and then uh, professional letters of recommendation would be lowest for like PhD and research driven disciplines, but for like an education, vocational skills based degree, like an MAT or master's in higher ed or something like that, the professional recommendation moves up a little bit and is like a little bit more accepted or welcome. <clears throat> so if you're like cramped for time or if you're like, oh, I don't actually have three pre tenured professors, who I have a strong enough relationship with who could write for me for the March 1st deadline for IRT, that's cool. But begin cultivating intentionally rapport with faculty now if you're still in school or begin reaching out to the you know, professors who you do have in your network and asking them 
about like, oh, is there someone else you could connect me with? Or like, you know, maybe you reach out to a professor who you took maybe just one class with, but you're trying to establish a relationship so that by the time you're submitting your graduate school applications in November, <clears throat> you would have cultivated a stronger relationship. Um, I do see the question in the chat, but we also have someone with their hand raised. So we'll we'll call on, is it Elise? Yes. Thanks for being here. Please uh, share your question with us. <laughs> um, I actually have two questions. So my first question is about essay theory. Um, how do you know whether to answer like the supplement of the, the second questions? My, I mean, like specifically for social sciences, like what do you guys count as like a social science? Um, yes, I'm just gonna pull up the PowerPoint again for reference in case that's helpful for folks who want to <clears throat> uh, refresh. <clears throat> so essay question for arts and sciences, essays, the part A is a social science applicants. Um, the social sciences are sociology, psychology, anthropology, um communications i think would probably fall under that <clears throat> i think those are the main ones leslie is there i yeah, mean i guess you're back. asking sorry can we go back to the list where we have the fields yes we can yeah okay so yeah the political the sciences are a good way anthropology sociology as Brittany was saying um psychology, um, sociology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What field are you? Um, well, none of those. <laughs> um, it's English, um, complete and or African and African-American studies. Okay, so you, you're in the humanities. Yeah. yeah I think yeah. that's more definitively humanities than arts, yep. <clears throat> Okay, um, this is just a follow up question to that. So like what, like the fields I listed, would I have to answer the social science applicants or? No, and I'm thinking about like Africana studies or related uh, applicants we've had in the past and whether they have responded to this or whether we felt some type of way about, about whether they responded or not. And I think my instinct, Leslie, correct me if I'm wrong is, no, they don't respond to this question. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm leaning towards- Well, I'm thinking you, know. you said you're- What did you say? You, you said your fields are, you said history? Um, English, um, complete and or African and African-American studies. Mm -hmm. But we want her to discuss her current project too, no? Um, well, yeah, that's the base question. That's the basic question here, right? Please describe your current okay. research interests in the in the specific schools of thought. <clears throat> um, I suppose what Leslie's getting at is it would be valuable for even folks in the humanities who are pursuing research driven degrees or, or fields to answer this question. So if you know that you're pursuing a PhD in you know, English complet, Africana studies or something in that realm with the goal of conducting research, like that is like a, a big part of why you're doing this, then this would be valuable. I think that's what Leslie's getting at. Yeah, and, and now that you mentioned it, Brittany, it, we don't typically, yeah, she, she's correct. For, for humanities, we do not, typically ask them to do that question. Um, yes, I'll just leave it at that because I, I personally would like that question answered. It gives me context, but based on what we have here, you would not need to answer that as a humanities person. Exactly, I think that's exactly yeah. the right answer. Okay, um, and my second question is actually on the application. So I like look, I um, look, went through the application materials online and I don't see a tab for the essay questions. I don't know if I'm like looking at it the wrong way, but um, 
at least from my end, I don't see like a tab for essay questions. Hmm. Um, that would be highly concerning if that was the case. <laughs> yes, I'll we're getting that. online to check it out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's not something that Leslie and I can like live check in this moment just because of the way the application portal system works. You know, it, like Sarah, our colleague Sarah would have to log into that and then um, check it on the back end. She has back end editing access. So the best that we could say is we will confirm or deny that it exists or does not exist. <laughs> and um, we could probably um what's the best way maybe like you could like drop your email address in the chat for us and we could follow up or i'm like mm, we, i wish we had some way of you all having like registered oh no if you started an inquiry we can um email an update to everyone who has started who has entered an inquiry on the website sarah can send out because you all have already received like email blasts i'm sure from from us that have reminders and things and like updates so Yes, <clears throat> I'm definitely happy to do personal follow up with you, though, if you do want to like shoot either Leslie and I an email or put your email address in the chat, we can make sure to do like a direct follow up in a day or two, but we can blast everybody who started an application or inquired on the website that like, ah, oh, yes, this tab was missing, it now can be found <laughs> or like, oh, there isn't a tab, but if you look after section whatever the essays are there right so we can definitely clarify and follow up with folks. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks for your diligence. Brittany, we can't get into it. I'm on the IRT page. I, I, it's asking me about a login. We've got to create a, an account to get in. No, well, if you do that, you, you'll just be like, it'll, it'll be treating you like a student. Right. But that'll allow me to get in and see, right? I suppose. Yeah, but, but I don't. I think like the, it might be iterative, like you can only like view a section if you've answered all the questions. You are right. Yes. Yes. That's, <laughs> so that's, I, I just feel like the back end is the. the I hate the, that about applications. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you want to see the questions. I want to see all the questions. I want to be able to print them out. And then, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm like, you know, like Leslie or if someone else is logged in and they're like, yeah, I'm in here and I'd like to confirm or deny what Alicia is saying, you know, like definitely welcome that anecdotal sort yeah. of like evidence, but we can't do anything about it from this side of things, right? Yeah. Like we need Sarah, yeah. our colleagues back in access to actually do something. So Alicia, I have your um, contact info saved and thank you for, again, your diligence on that. <clears throat> um, all right. The next question that we had in the chat was, um, do IRT students receive support with GRE prep? It's a fantastic question. And the answer is yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy to give like a brief overview and then let Leslie augment anything I may miss. We have partnered with three organizations that have agreed to provide discounted GRE prep and other advantages to IRT scholars. So IRT does not directly pay for services like on your behalf, but we've like partnered with organizations who are willing to extend discounts to in benefits to you all. So the two GRE prep organizations that we've partnered with are Kaplan and Magoosh. Kaplan offers like a live online inst instructor course, like someone is like actually teaching you classes around how to be successful in the GRE. It comes with a book and an online portal and it's a little more expensive. Um, Magoosh is more asynchronous and autonomous. It comes with like a bunch of apps and flashcards and things that you can download. It has like an online dashboard and it's a little bit cheaper, <clears throat> but both are significantly discounted from the market rates. And then we've also partnered with ETS, which is the organization that administers the GRE to provide you all with a registration discount. So it's something like a 40 or 50% discount on registering for the GRE. And there are some supplemental prep services that come with that package from ETS. I think a couple of practice tests and like some other um, uh, like maximize your GRE experience kinds of resources. <laughs> so short and long answer, <laughs> yes. And <laughs> these three orgs. <clears throat> Okay, um, I see we have a hand, um, Dan Daniel. And Daniel, have you applied before? Why, your, your name seems awfully familiar to me. I applied last year, yeah. Okay, that's good. I'm glad 
<laughs> so welcome and what's up? Yeah, so I am on my portal on the IRT application and maybe it's a question that I could uh, email someone about but for some reason I, I choose the specific essays for education but when I go to the uh, tab to upload the essays it still shows up as arts and social sciences so maybe it's a technical issue that um, I could connect with someone about. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to clarify so you wouldn't be uploading anything you would be responding directly into a text box for yep. the mm -hmm. essays. Yeah okay. sorry yeah pasting Okay, that. perfect. Yep. I just wanted to like make sure that was. Um, so you're saying you choose education and then it displays arts and sciences. Yeah, on the essays tab. All right, we'll just add that to the list Good. of inquiries for Sarah. <laughs> um, so no tab visible, visible for essays is the first thing that Elise brought up. And then Daniel is saying, selecting ANS or selecting education essays uh, brings, still brings up ANS. Um, I guess we'll just say for the record and for the audience that uh, the, the position in the office that normally administers the recruitment and admissions part of our organization has been vacant for a few months. So we've been piecemealing together the work that like this individual would normally do across the rest of the staff, which is why some things may seem a little, you know, like disorganized or some pieces may not be fully together because we've been, all of us have taken just like a little chunk of our time and committed it to a whole job that like a, a different person would be doing. So thank you for your diligence and for troubleshooting with us. We appreciate that you're like bringing these things up because we haven't had someone with like their eyes only on this for a while. And so that's why these little things can like slip through um, the cracks. So this is really helpful and fantastic. I'm sorry that we don't have an immediate like response or fix for you in this moment. We'll follow up though. Um, so Daniel, do you wanna send your email in the chat as well? Just so I can make sure that we do some like targeted um, follow up in addition to clarifying with everyone who's, you know, submitted an inquiry. <clears throat> Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. And I think we saw another. So Dan had a question. I think this is related to the GRE prep that your question. Yeah. Yeah. It's like yeah. if a student like was admitted, like I think you said people get admitted in like May, but they also get like the fall team. We're like, oh, here are some of these offers. You're going to be inundated <laughs> with emails. You'll, you'll have access to our Canvas, which is a platform where we, we put a lot of resources and where you also will upload your assignments. So you'll, yes, definitely. That'll be one of the first things that goes out um, about GRE because another colleague, Sarah, she will compile what, what program everyone wants. She receives the checks. She lets ETS know and Kaplan and Magoosh know who the students are. So yes, that information will come very quickly after you've been admitted. <clears throat> if you watched the general info session recording or attended one of our uh, live sessions in the fall, you would remember that there are four seasons to the IRT year or the, the IRT program. And the first season is admissions and orientation that happens in May and June. And part of that is receiving all of this information. Here's all the resources available to you. Here are the GRE prep options available to you. Here's the, as Leslie was describing, access to our learning management system. And so yes, that uh, what all that information and the costs and the benefits and all that are like the some of the first materials that you have access to. <clears throat> Other thoughts, questions, um, just things that people are thinking about. Any like nerves in particular, or you know, like anxieties or worries. <clears throat> about the application, let me be specific. <laughs> we could have a whole other Zoom hour committed to other concerns. 
I do have a question. You mentioned that we had to have attended the informational session. Is that the are those the, are those the ones that were on the seventh and the ninth of December? That's correct. Yep, there were there were four. So there were two in December, and I believe two in November. A recording of one of those is on the website, and so long as you've watched that recording, even if you were not in attendance live, that counts as attending an info session online. So awesome. we're going to ask you that when we interview you, right? Like, okay, we're going to fast forward to March 3rd. You've submitted your application. We're inviting everybody to interview. The first question of the interview is, did you watch or attend an info session? So if you get to that point and you're like, no, we're like, go do it then we'll do the interview <laughs> understood yeah. thank you for that cheers we know it's the end of the week huh <laughs> thursday afternoon <laughs> yeah we're all worn out <laughs> counting it down to the weekend I think one thing I would say is that, um, oh, yep, yeah, we do have a question. I was, I'll just finish my thought. Just because you all are here, you're already in a great position to submit a strong application, right? So if you're like worried about, oh, what if I answer the wrong essay question? What if I don't get this in? What if I do 156 words, you know, instead of 150? Like you're already setting yourself apart from the other applicants, you know, who maybe, maybe they're going to watch it retroactively and that's fine. But have faith that you're in good shape. Um, next question. I'm very encouraging, thank you. Um, I have a question about um, the essays. I'm looking at the questions for the essays and um, one in particular under like arts and social sciences, it talked about describing three texts. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to, I don't know, I guess ask for more specific, specific um, directions about it because I can think about different texts um you know that are related to this question I just want to make sure I'm using the correct te text and I'm not like using something and then it's like wait this is not what we expected or something that we think is appropriate yeah <clears throat> definitely can speak to this more um I think first we can start by, you know, addressing like this, this first, you know, caveat here, this first expectation that one of the texts is canonical. Uh, mm -hmm. What does canonical mean? What is the canon of a discipline? Maybe you haven't been super familiar with that terminology yet. Uh, as described, a canon is just a like widely accepted group of scholarship that is considered representative of, descriptive of, you know, the flagship theories and text for a particular school of thought, for a particular discipline or field. And so an example of this would be something like um, Paulo Fieri's Pedagogy of the Oppressed would be a great, you know, sort of canonical text for education and, and classroom teaching. I think that would be appropriate to say. Um, something like, <clears throat> um, Oh my God, why is my brain not functioning? Like a bell hooks as well for education. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. Like... <clears throat> um, so something that's widely recognized, right? Like lots and lots of people would acknowledge that this scholar, this piece of text, this scholar, this idea, this theory is representative of the field, like Sigmund Freud or Carl Jung in psychology. Those they're, they're, those are canonical mm -hmm. scholars, right? Um within that discipline. And so <clears throat> that's what that is getting at. Like, do you have a basic understanding of your field and can you use, you know, something that is typical of or representative of the discipline and talk about how that's influenced you or, or what your perspective of that text is for the work you wanna do. And then the other two can be a little bit outside of the discipline, but are, we're still looking for something that's critically theory focused. So that like ha makes commentary about the discipline, right? I'm thinking like earlier we were talking in a staff meeting, Lisa Delpit's Other People's Children, not necessarily a canonical text in education, but Delpit offers critical theory and commentary on education and classroom teaching in that text. So that could be an appropriate text to use <clears throat> for that context. Maybe something like, um, uh, like, in African American literature, um, if we're, you know, with all of our Africana studies, you know, something like 
Charles Mills white ignorance, like, or critical race theory, right? Something within critical race theory, like that could be applicable to a lot of different social sciences or humanities fields. Um, Spivak, Marx, uh, why can't I think of the other one? Um, the other back one. to oh. teaching, uh, teaching to tr transgress, the hooks. Uh, bell hooks, mm -hmm, again. <clears throat> Yeah, so critical theory is like commentary on a field or a discipline, right? Uh, it's like a, a new proposed idea or um, a proposed concept that <clears throat> is widely accepted and acknowledged or that offers critical commentary. Does this help? Are we making it worse <laughs> or are we helping? No, it's, it's making it more clear, but it's also like blurring it a little bit. I mean, I'm thinking because I'm a psych major, so a lot of, a lot of theorists can also be like commentators in my field. And I've seen that often even in my studies. Um, so I think it kind of crosses for me. So I don't know, I don't know how to exactly distinguish it exactly how I guess maybe I'm thinking you guys would ex expect it, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think what I can say on this is what we're looking for is your ability to read something, understand it, summarize it and then make the connection to the work that you specifically want to do in that field. So not so much the text selection, which like is important and is a factor. And, you know, if you are applying to, um, you know, PhDs in English and, and yet you're, you know, sharing texts that are from like French literature or something like, oh, maybe, maybe we're going to eyeball that and be like, well, what's the connection? This isn't like an obvious fit within the discipline. But if you, succinctly articulately comprehensively make the connections like oh this is what this text contributed to my field or this is what this text taught me or the knowledge that I took from this that I hope to apply and you can like summarize it then like that is still a strong response yeah. to this question so I think we're very forgiving and we're really looking for like critical reading critical writing critical thinking skills here like can you articulate something you've read explain that concept to an audience and then draw conclusions or make connections from that to your own work. Does that, okay. I think that is probably the most. Okay. Yeah, that answers my question because now after you said it that way, I can think of a few things that'll, that'll work for this. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Perfect. It only took three tries to get to the, the right response. <laughs> so thank you for your patience. Um, yeah, so question. The, yeah, would a prominent experiment study in the field work for this question as well, of course, yes. And to, yep, yep. Um, okay, we had a question about letters of rec. Yes. For the letters of recommendation, will there be a section for recommenders to access themselves and input uh, the letters? <laughs> so there will be another demystifying webinar specifically about letters of rec, but just to preempt that, in case you're not able to be with us live, uh, IRT uses a letter of recommendation form. So it's not actually a generic letter that we ask for. It's actually like a set of 10 Likert scale questions, which is the like strongly disagree to strongly agree. And then uh, I think maybe five or so um, short answer questions, because we really want to get at specific like skill sets and things um, from recommenders. And so you will put in recommender names and email addresses into the application and then an automated email with a link to that form will go to their inboxes. And uh, then they will just fill out the form and hit submit. And then you will be able to see on the application portal that a letter has been submitted on your behalf. <clears throat> Okay, cool. Daniel put some contact info. I see you. Thanks for being here. Um, yep. Okay. Great. Definitely a prominent, like the ACE study. I don't know if anyone uh, is familiar with the adverse childhood events, the, the big ACE study they did, I think in Philadelphia is, is the, is the original. Yeah, I was, I was thinking of something similar <laughs> actually. So thank you. Perfect. Yeah, that'd be a really good one. Yep. Alexis, have you applied before too? For some reason, your name feels really familiar to me. I haven't, but my mom has, so. Okay. Um, a couple of years ago, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Oh. Did we admit her? Yes, she was okay. admitted, um, and then she had some life stuff come up, but she was like, you should definitely go for it, so totally. I'm excited. Love that. Keep it in the family. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yes. 
we've had moms, we've had sisters, we've had individuals find each other as, you know, and become couples and get married. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> All right. Other like lingering thoughts, questions, ruminations? I like that we kind of have a little core group going here. You know, I'm excited to see folks next week. Yeah. If you don't show up, I'm going to be disappointed now. So yeah. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. Uh, yeah, I'm kidding. Of course, I'm <laughs> kidding. It will not affect your application if you do not come to the other four <laughs> webinars. <clears throat> it certainly reflects positively on you, though, like thinking about graduate school skills and professional development skills, one of the things that we encourage our scholars to do when they're identifying prospective graduate programs is to connect with people from the program, right? Like talk to admissions counselors, talk to graduate school deans and leaders, talk to fac department faculty or program coordinators, talk to current graduate students to get, you know, some insider info. And this attending this webinar is like the equivalent of that outreach and that rapport building, because now I know all your names. And when I'm sorting through 300 applications, these 20, you know, are gonna stand out as like, oh yes, I've seen these before and I can put a face to that name. So well done folks. <laughs> Go ahead, Tatiana. <clears throat> I'm actually completing the application now while we're on um, the call. Uh, I have a question about the ethnicity question. I always have trouble with this question. I have a lot of feelings about it. Um, I don't know what to put here. <laughs> We have feelings about this too, and um, have gone back and forth about how we ask this question for a f many years, a few years. Um, but we do think it's important to like be able to, you know, have a sense of who our people are, right? So we still ask it. So if you had recommendations for how you would like it to be asked, we would take that. Um, it's really kind of, I think you can self-identify in whatever way feels right to you I think you have the option to write something in right like you have the option to like yeah, write in. It. it's usually like a drop down and I you guys have like actually another drop down that's like what's your race ethnicity next to it so I don't know what you're asking exactly with this one to write in so like some folks will uh identify something like they'll say oh I identify as Asian or South Asian but like my actual nationality or like where my parents you know immigrated from is this particular country or something like that or you know I'm African or African diasporic or African American but I'm actually you know my lineage is Ghanaian or something to that effect so you okay. can determine whatever makes sense for you folks write in things like Afro Latina or mixed mm -hmm. race or biracial or mm -hmm. multiracial you know so if you have an identifier that you use and that's what you claim then that's why we leave the the right in space because it would be impossible for us to list you know every possible race racial ethnic identity that exists that people use to identify themselves so to avoid kind of like forcing people into boxes we want to make sure that the option for you to self-identify is present i'm caribbean right i'm i'm south i'm latina but i'm specifically argentinian or something right like <clears throat> Yeah, I think that's great. The only, I guess then I, the only feedback I would give is just give a specifier, like specifying what you want there or like an example. That's it. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> I-E, right option. in, yes, yeah. okay. Yep, perfect. I'm gonna mark that down in my little uh, notes here. Thank you. <clears throat> you guys are making us better. You're not even part of the program yet. Like, get out of here. <laughs> oh. uh, go ahead. Is it Erin? Hi, um, it's Erin. Erin. Okay, thank you for correcting me. Welcome. What can we do for you? No, thank you. I'm appreciating all the information and taking down notes. I guess, like, this probably should wait for the um, interview session, but I have a question about it. Sure. If since we're like thinking about like putting together our application, you know, getting our recommendations and kind of completing it in a timely fashion, my only question is if we complete the application, let's say before the next semester right now, would we be immediately scheduled for an interview or is it still going to take place in March? It's a great question. So we 
do not even consider anyone we don't we don't do rolling admissions that's what i'm trying to say so we don't look at the applications until the march 1st deadline and on march 2nd we determine which applications are complete and everyone on march 2nd who has a complete application gets invited to interview so if you complete the application tomorrow you're still not going to hear from us until the, after the application closes on march 1st Okay, thank you so much. 100% clear now. Yeah, you're welcome. It's a good question. Yeah, definitely. definitely. <clears throat> We've gone back and forth about that too as well <laughs> in other conversations. <clears throat> yeah. And and to be quite honest, you know, at this point we're giving this we're doing the webinars. We're still working with the current applicants and we're short two staff folks. Um and so <laughs> yeah, we will not be looking at anything until the March 1st. It's a fun wild west in the nonprofit world. Mm -hmm. In the midst of a panini. <laughs> <laughs> a Panasonic that won't end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh. Other questions, concerns, comments, suggestions? Yeah, we'll even take recommendations <laughs> in the like 18 or so minutes we have left. I love it. This means that y'all are going to be so prepared. I, I'm super excited to read these applications. Hey, if that's it, if we did it, if everyone feels good, we can let you all go. We can release you to the wild yes. and uh, say, we'll see you next Tuesday. Yes. These, right. the, these um, webinars will go up Monday. Yes. Yep. Just FYI. And then there's two more next week and then two the following week. And it'll be Brittany and I again. <laughs> to see you. Oh, you'll be sick of us in no time. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone. You're fantastic. Appreciate your thoughtfulness. See you soon. Take good care. Enjoy your weekends. Take care. Good night. Good night.